Chapter Seven of the Ice Maiden and Other Tales by Hans Christian Andersen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ellie Cat. The Ice Maiden, Chapter Six: The Eagle's Nest. Merry and loud sounded the yodel from the mountain path. It indicated good humor and joyous courage. It was Rudy. He was going to visit his friend Vesenand. You must help me. We will take Rogli with us. I am going after the eaglet on the brink of the rock. Do you not wish to go after the black spot in the moon? That is quite as easy, said Vesenand, and you are in a good humor. Yes, because I am thinking of my wedding, but seriously you shall know how my affairs stand. Vesenand and Rogli soon knew what Rudy wished. You are a bold fellow, said they. Do not do this, you will break your neck. One does not fall when one does not think of it, said Rudy. About midday they set out with poles, ladders, and ropes. Their path lay through bushes and brambles, over the rolling stones, up, up in the dark night. The water rushed beneath them, the water flowed above them, and the human clouds chased after each other in the air. The hunters approached the steep brink of the rock. It became darker and darker, the rocky walls almost met. High above them in the narrow fissure the air penetrated and gave light. Under their feet was a deep abyss with its roaring waters. They all three sat still, awaiting the gray of the morning. Then the eagle would fly out. They must shoot him before they could think of obtaining the young one. Rudy seemed to be a part of the stone on which he sat. His rifle placed before him, ready to take aim, his eyes immovably fastened on yon high cleft which concealed the eagle's nest. The three huntsmen waited long. A crashing, whizzing noise sounded high above them. A large, hovering object darkened the air. Two rifle barrels were aimed as the black eagle flew from its nest. A shot was heard. The outspread wings moved an instant. Then the bird slowly sank, as if it wished to fill the entire cliff with its outstretched wings and bury the huntsman in its fall. The eagle sank in the deep. The branches of the trees and bushes cracked, broken by the fall of the bird. They now displayed their activity. Three of the longest ladders were tied together. They stood them on the furthest point where the foot could place itself with security, close to the brink of the precipice. But they were not long enough. There was still a great space from the outermost projecting cliff which protected the nest. The rocky wall was perfectly smooth. After some consultation, they decided to lower into the opening two ladders tied together and to fasten them to the three already beneath them. With great difficulty they dragged them up and attached them with cords. The ladder shot over their projecting cliffs and hung over the chasm. Rudy sat already on the lowest round. It was an ice-cold morning, and the mist mounted from the black ravine. Rudy sat there like a fly on a rocking blade of grass, which a nest-building bird has dropped in its hasty flight on the edge of a factory chimney but the fly had the advantage of escaping by its wings. Poor Rudy had none, he was almost sure to break his neck. The wind whistled around him, and the roaring water from the thawed glaciers, the palace of the ice maiden, poured itself into the abyss. He gave the ladders a swinging motion, as the spider swings herself by her long thread. He seized them with a strong and steady hand, but they shook as if they had worn-out hasps. The five long ladders looked like a tremulous reed, as they reached the nest and hung perpendicularly over the rocky wall. Now came the most dangerous part. Rudy had to climb as a cat climbs, but Rudy could do this, for the cat had taught it to him. He did not feel that Vertigo trod in the air behind him and stretched her polypus-like arms towards him. Now he stood on the highest round of the ladder and perceived that he was not sufficiently high to enable him to see into the nest. He could reach it with his hands. He tried how firm the twigs were, which plated in one another formed the bottom of the nest. When he had assured himself of a thick and immovable one, he swung himself off the ladder. He had his breast and head over the nest, out of which streamed towards him a stifling stench of carrion. Torn limbs, chamois and birds lay decomposing around him. Vertigo, who had no power over him, blew poisonous vapors into his face to stupefy him. Below, in the black, yawning abyss, sat the ice-maiden herself, on the hastening water, 
with her long greenish-white hair, and stared at him with death-like eyes, which were pointed at him like two rifle barrels. Now I shall catch you. Seated in one corner of the eagle's nest was the eaglet, who could not fly yet, although so strong and powerful. Rudy fastened his eyes on it, held himself with his whole strength firmly by one hand, and with the other threw the noose around it. It was captured alive, its legs were in the knot. Rudy cast the rope over his shoulder, so that the animal dangled some distance below him, and sustained himself by another rope which hung down, until his feet touched the upper round of the ladder. Hold fast, do not think that you will fall, and then you are sure not to do so. That was the old lesson, and he followed it. Held fast, climbed, was sure not to fall, and he did not. There resounded a strong yodeling, and a joyous one too. Rudy stood on the firm, rocky ground with the young eaglet. End of chapter 7